Oscar Schindler, the 28th of April 1908, the 9th of October 1974, was a German industrialist and a member of the Nazi Party, who is credited with saving the lives of 1,200 Jews during the Holocaust by employing them in his enamel ware and ammunitions factories in occupied Poland and the Protectorate of Bohemia and Moravia. He is the subject of the 1982 novel Schindler's Ark and its 1993 film adaptation, Schindler's List, which reflected his life as an opportunist initially motivated by profit, who came to show extraordinary initiative, tenacity, courage, and dedication to save the lives of his Jewish employees. Schindler grew up in Zwitau, Moravia, and worked in several trades until he joined the Opwehr, the military intelligence service of Nazi Germany, in 1936. He joined the Nazi party in 1939. Prior to the beginning of German occupation of Czechoslovakia in 1938, he collected information on railways and troop movements for the German government. He was arrested for espionage by the Czechoslovak government but was released under the terms of the Munich Agreement that year. Schindler continued to collect information for the Nazis, working in Poland in 1939 before the invasion of Poland at the start of World War II. In 1939, Schindler acquired an enamelware factory in Krakow, Poland, which employed at the factory's peak in 1944 about 1,750 workers, of whom 1,000 were Jews. His Opfair connections helped Schindler protect his Jewish workers from deportation and death in the Nazi concentration camps. As time went on, Schindler had to give Nazi officials ever larger bribes and gifts of luxury items obtainable only on the black market to keep his workers safe. By July 1944, Germany was losing the war, the SS began closing down the easternmost concentration camps and deporting the remaining prisoners westward. Many were murdered in Auschwitz and the Gross Rosen concentration camp. Schindler convinced SS Hauptsturmfuhrer Hermann Goth, commandant of the nearby Krakow Plazau concentration camp, to allow him to move his factory to Berninek in the protectorate of Bohemia and Moravia, thus sparing his workers from almost certain death in the gas chambers. Using names provided by Jewish ghetto police officer Marcel Goldberg, Goth's secretary Miatek Pemper compiled and typed the list of 1,200 Jews who traveled to Brunlitz in October 1944. Schindler continued to bribe SS officials to prevent the execution of his workers until the end of World War II in Europe in May 1945, by which time he had spent his entire fortune on bribes and black market purchases of supplies for his workers. Schindler moved to West Germany after the war, where he was supported by assistance payments from Jewish relief organizations. After receiving a partial reimbursement for his wartime expenses, he moved with his wife Emily to Argentina, where they took up farming. When he went bankrupt in 1958, Schindler left his wife and returned to Germany, where he failed at several business ventures and relied on financial support from Skindlergeden, the people whose lives he had saved during the war. He died on 9 October 1974 in Hildesheim, Germany, and was buried in Jerusalem on Mount Zion, the only former member of the Nazi party to be honored in this way. He and his wife Emily were named righteous among the nations by the Israeli government in 1993. Chapter 1, Life Chapter 1 Section 1, Early Life and Education Schindler was born on 28 April 1908, into a Zuditan German family in Zwitau, Moravia, Austria-Hungary. His father was Johann Hans Schindler, the owner of a farm machinery business, and his mother was Franziska Fanny Schindler. His sister, Elfrieda, was born in 1915. After attending primary and secondary school, Schindler enrolled in a technical school, from which he was expelled in 1924 for forging his report card. He later graduated, but did not take the obituary exams that would have enabled him to go to college or university. Instead, he took courses in Brno in several trades, including chauffeuring and machinery, and worked for his father for three years. A fan of motorcycles since his youth, Schindler bought a 250cc Moto Goetze racing motorcycle and competed recreationally in mountain races for the next few years. On 6 March 1928, 
Schindler married Emily Peltzel, daughter of a prosperous Sudeten German farmer from Malatine. The young couple moved in with Oscar's parents and occupied the upstairs rooms, where they lived for the next seven years. Soon after his marriage, Schindler quit working for his father and took a series of jobs, including a position at Moravian Electrotechnic and the management of a driving school. After an 18-month stint in the Czech Army, where he rose to the rank of Lance Corporal in the 10th Infantry Regiment of the 31st Army, Schindler returned to Moravian Electrotechnic, which went bankrupt shortly afterwards. His father's farm machinery business closed around the same time, leaving Schindler unemployed for a year. He took a job with Yaroslav Simic Bank of Prague in 1931, where he worked until 1938. Schindler was arrested several times in 1931 and 1932 for public drunkenness. Also around this time he had an affair with Aurelie Schlegel, a school friend. She bore him a daughter, Emily, in 1933, and a son, Oscar Jr., in 1935. Schindler later claimed the boy was not his son. Schindler's father, an alcoholic, abandoned his wife in 1935. She died a few months later after a lengthy illness. Chapter 1 Section 2 Spy for the Opwehr Schindler joined the separatist Sudeten German Party in 1935. Although he was a citizen of Czechoslovakia, Schindler became a spy for the Opwehr the military intelligence service of Nazi Germany, in 1936. He was assigned to Arbuistel II Commando 8, based in Breslau. He later told Czech police that he did it because he needed the money, by this time Schindler had a drinking problem and was chronically in debt. His tasks for the Opwehr included collecting information on railways, military installations, and troop movements, as well as recruiting other spies within Czechoslovakia, in advance of a planned invasion of the country by Nazi Germany. He was arrested by the Czech government for espionage on 18 July 1938, and immediately imprisoned, but was released as a political prisoner under the terms of the Munich Agreement, the instrument under which the Czech Sudetenland was annexed into Germany on 1 October. Schindler applied for membership in the Nazi party on 1 November and was accepted the following year. After some time off to recover in Zwitau, Schindler was promoted to second in command of his Opwehr unit and relocated with his wife to Ostrava, on the Czech Polish border, in January 1939. He was involved in espionage in the months leading up to Hitler's seizure of the remainder of Czechoslovakia in March. Emily helped him with paperwork processing and hiding secret documents in their apartment for the Opwehr office. As Schindler frequently travelled to Poland on business, he and his 25 agents were in a position to collect information about Polish military activities and railways for the planned invasion of Poland. One assignment called for his unit to monitor and provide information about the railway line and tunnel in the Jablunkow Pass, deemed critical for the movement of German troops. Schindler continued to work for the Opfair until as late as fall 1940, when he was sent to Turkey to investigate corruption among the Opfair officers assigned to the German embassy there. Chapter 1 Section 3 – World War II Chapter 1 Section 3 – Subsection 2 – Emalia Schindler first arrived in Krakow in October 1939, on Opfair business, and took an apartment the following month. Emily maintained the apartment in Ostrava and visited Oscar in Krakow at least once a week. In November 1939, he contacted interior decorator Mila Pfefferberg to decorate his new apartment. Her son, Leopold Poldik Pfefferberg, soon became one of his contacts for black market trading. They eventually became lifelong friends. Also, that November, Schindler was introduced to Itzak Stern an accountant for Schindler's fellow Opwehr agent Joseph Sepaue, who had taken over Stern's formerly Jewish-owned place of employment, as a Trierhander. Property belonging to Polish Jews, including their possessions, places of business, and homes were seized by the Germans beginning immediately after the invasion, and Jewish citizens were stripped of their civil rights. Schindler showed Stern the balance sheet of a company he was thinking of acquiring, an enamelware factory called Raycourt Limited owned by a consortium of Jewish businessmen, that had filed for bankruptcy earlier that year. 
Sterling advised him that rather than running the company as a trusteeship under the auspices of the Hauptreohanstel Ost, he should buy or lease the business, as that would give him more freedom from the dictates of the Nazis, including the freedom to hire more Jews. With the financial backing of several Jewish investors, including one of the owners, Abraham Bankier, Schindler signed an informal lease agreement on the factory on 13 November 1939 and formalized the arrangement on 15 January 1940. He renamed it Deutsche Email when Fabrik or Def, and it soon became known by the nickname Emilia. He initially acquired a staff of seven Jewish workers and 250 non Jewish Poles. At its peak in 1944, the business employed around 1,750 workers, a thousand of whom were Jews. Schindler also helped run Shlomo Wiener Limited, a wholesale outfit that sold his enamelware and was leaseholder of Prokosina Glashut, a glass factory. Schindler's ties with the Opwehr and his connections in the Wehrmacht and its armaments inspectorate enabled him to obtain contracts to produce enamel cookware for the military. These connections also later helped him protect his Jewish workers, from deportation and death. As time went on, Schindler had to give Nazi officials ever larger bribes and gifts of luxury items obtainable only on the black market to keep his workers safe. Bankier, a key black market connection, obtained goods for bribes as well as extra materials for use in the factory. Schindler himself enjoyed a lavish lifestyle and pursued extramarital relationships with his secretary, Victoria Klonowska, and Eva Kishscheuer, a merchant specializing in enamelware from death. Emily Schindler visited for a few months in 1940 and moved to Krakow to live with Oscar in 1941. Initially, Schindler was mostly interested in the money-making potential of the business and hired Jews because they were cheaper than Poles, the wages were set by the occupying Nazi regime. Later he began shielding his workers without regard for cost. The status of his factory as a business essential to the war effort became a decisive factor enabling him to help his Jewish workers. Whenever Schindlerjuden were threatened with deportation, he claimed exemptions for them. He claimed wives, children, and even people with disabilities were necessary mechanics and metal workers. On one occasion, the Gestapo came to Schindler demanding that he hand over a family that possessed forged identity papers. Three hours after they walked in, Schindler said, two drunk Gestapo men reeled out of my office without their prisoners and without the incriminating documents they had demanded. On the 1st of August 1940, Governor-General Hans Frank issued a decree requiring all Krakow Jews to leave the city within two weeks. Only those who had jobs directly related to the German war effort would be allowed to stay. Of the 60,000 to 80,000 Jews then living in the city, only 15,000 remained by March 1941. These Jews were then forced to leave their traditional neighborhood of Kazimierz and relocate to the walled Krakow ghetto, established in the industrial Podgas district. Schindler's workers traveled on foot to and from the ghetto each day to their jobs at the factory. Enlargements to the facility in the four years Schindler was in charge included the addition of an outpatient clinic, co-op, kitchen, and dining room for the workers, in addition to expansion of the factory, and its related office space. Chapter 1 Section 3 Subsection 3 Plazau in fall 1941, the Nazis began transporting Jews out of the ghetto. Most of them were sent to the Belzec extermination camp and murdered. On 13 March 1943, the ghetto was liquidated and those still fit for work were sent to the new concentration camp at Plazau. Several thousand not deemed fit for work were sent to extermination camps and murdered, hundreds more were murdered on the streets by the Nazis as they cleared out the ghetto. Schindler, aware of the plans because of his Wehrmacht contacts, had his workers stay at the factory overnight to prevent them coming to harm. Schindler witnessed the liquidation of the ghetto and was appalled. From that point forward, says Schindler Jude Sol Obok, Schindler changed his mind about the Nazis. He decided to get out and to save as many Jews as he could. 
Plazar concentration camp opened in March 1943 on the former site of two Jewish cemeteries on Jerozolimska Street, about 2.5 kilometers from the Def factory. In charge of the camp was SS Hauptsturmfuhrer Emon Goth, a sadist who would shoot inmates of the camp at random. Inmates at Plazau lived in constant fear for their lives. Emily Schindler called Goth the most despicable man I have ever met. Initially Goth's plan was that all the factories, including Schindler's, should be moved inside the camp gates. However, Schindler, with a combination of diplomacy, flattery, and bribery, not only prevented his factory from being moved, but convinced Goth to allow him to build a subcamp at Emalia to house his workers plus 450 Jews from other nearby factories. There they were safe from the threat of random execution, were well fed and housed, and were permitted to undertake religious observances. Schindler was arrested twice on suspicion of black market activities and once for breaking the Nuremberg laws by kissing a Jewish girl, an action forbidden by the Race and Resettlement Act. The first arrest, in late 1941, led to him being kept overnight. His secretary arranged for his release through Schindler's influential contacts in the Nazi party. His second arrest, on 29 April 1942, was the result of his kissing a Jewish girl on the cheek at his birthday party at the factory the previous day. He remained in jail five days before his influential Nazi contacts were able to obtain his release. In October 1944, he was arrested again, accused of black marketeering and bribing Goth and others to improve the conditions of the Jewish workers. He was held for most of a week and released. Goth had been arrested on 13 September 1944 for corruption and other abuses of power, and Schindler's arrest was part of the ongoing investigation into Goth's activities. Goth was never convicted on those charges, but was hanged by the Supreme National Tribunal of Poland for war crimes on 13 September 1946. In 1943, Schindler was contacted via members of the Jewish resistance movement by Zionist leaders in Budapest. Schindler traveled there several times to report in person on Nazi mistreatment of the Jews. He brought back funding provided by the Jewish Agency for Israel and turned it over to the Jewish underground. Chapter 1 Section 3 Subsection 4 Brunlitz As the Red Army drew nearer in July 1944, the SS began closing down the easternmost concentration camps and evacuating the remaining prisoners westward to Auschwitz and Gross Rosen concentration camp. Goth's personal secretary, Miatek Pemper, alerted Schindler to the Nazis' plans to close all factories not directly involved in the war effort, including Schindler's enamelware facility. Pemper suggested to Schindler that production should be switched from cookware to anti-tank grenades in an effort to save the lives of the Jewish workers. Using bribery and his powers of persuasion, Schindler convinced Goth and the officials in Berlin to allow him to move his factory and his workers to Brunlitz, in the Zudetenant, thus sparing them from certain death in the gas chambers. Using names provided by Jewish ghetto police officer Marcel Goldberg, Pemper compiled and typed the list of 1,200 Jews, 1,000 of Schindler's workers and 200 inmates from Julius Madrich's textiles factory, who were sent to Brunlitz in October 1944. On 15 October 1944 a train carrying 700 men on Schindler's list was initially sent to the concentration camp at Gross Rosen, where the men spent about a week before being rerouted to the factory in Brunlitz. 300 female Schindlerjuden were similarly sent to Auschwitz, where they were in imminent danger of being sent to the gas chambers. Schindler's usual connections and bribes failed to obtain their release. Finally after he sent his secretary, Hilda Albrecht, with bribes of black market goods, food and diamonds, the women were sent to Brunlitz after several harrowing weeks in Auschwitz. In addition to workers, Schindler moved, 250 wagon loads of machinery and raw materials to the new factory. Few if any useful artillery shells were produced at the plant. When officials from the armaments ministry questioned the factory's low output, Schindler bought finished goods on the black market and resold them as his own. The rations provided by the SS were insufficient to meet the needs of the workers, so Schindler spent most of his time in Krakow, 
obtaining food, armaments, and other materials. His wife Emily remained in Brunlitz, surreptitiously obtaining additional rations and caring for the workers' health and other basic needs. Schindler also arranged for the transfer of as many as 3,000 Jewish women out of Auschwitz to small textiles plants in the Sudetenland in an effort to increase their chances of surviving the war. In January 1945, a trainload of 250 Jews who had been rejected as workers at a German mine in Galiskau in occupied Poland arrived at Brunlitz. The boxcars were frozen shut when they arrived and Emily Schindler waited while an engineer from the factory opened the cars using a soldering iron. Twelve people were dead in the cars, and the remainder were too ill and feeble to work. Emily took the survivors into the factory and cared for them in a makeshift hospital until the end of the war. Schindler continued to bribe SS officials to prevent the slaughter of his workers as the Red Army approached. On 7 May 1945 he and his workers gathered on the factory floor to listen to British Prime Minister Winston Churchill announce over the radio that Germany had surrendered, and the war in Europe was over. Chapter 1 Section 4 – After the War As a member of the Nazi Party in the Opfer Intelligence Service, Schindler was in danger of being arrested as a war criminal. Bankier, Stern, and several others prepared a statement he could present to the Americans attesting to his role in saving Jewish lives. He was also given a ring, made using gold from dental work taken out of the mouth of Skindler Jude Simon Gerrit. The ring was inscribed whoever saves one life saves the world entire. To escape being captured by the Russians, Schindler and his wife departed westward in their vehicle, a two-seater hawk, initially with several fleeing German soldiers riding on the running boards. A truck containing Schindler's mistress Martha, several Jewish workers, and a load of black market trade goods followed behind. The hawk was confiscated by Russian troops at the town of Budweis, which had already been captured by Russian troops. The Schindlers were unable to recover a diamond that Oscar had hidden under the seat. They continued by train and on foot until they reached the American lines at the town of Lenora, and then traveled to Passau, where an American Jewish officer arranged for them to travel to Switzerland by train. They moved to Bavaria in Germany in the fall of 1945. By the end of the war, Schindler had spent his entire fortune on bribes and black market purchases of supplies for his workers. Virtually destitute, he moved briefly to Regensburg and later Munich, but did not prosper in post-war Germany. In fact, he was reduced to receiving assistance from Jewish organizations. In 1948 he presented a claim for reimbursement of his wartime expenses to the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee, and received $15,000. He estimated his expenditures at over $1,056,000, including the costs of camp construction, bribes, and expenditures for black market goods, including food. Schindler emigrated to Argentina in 1949, where he tried raising chickens and then nutria, a small animal raised for its fur. When the business went bankrupt in 1958, he left his wife and returned to Germany, where he had a series of unsuccessful business ventures, including a cement factory. He declared bankruptcy in 1963 and suffered a heart attack the next year, which led to a month-long stay in hospital. Remaining in contact with many of the Jews he had met during the war, including Stern and Pfefferberg, Schindler survived on donations sent by Skindlerjuden from all over the world. He died on 9 October 1974 and is buried in Jerusalem on Mount Zion, the only member of the Nazi party to be honored in this way. For his work during the war, on 8 May 1962, Yad Vashem invited Schindler to a ceremony in which a carob tree was planted in his honor on the Avenue of the Righteous. He and his wife, Emily, were named Righteous Among the Nations, an award bestowed by the State of Israel on non-Jews who took an active role to rescue Jews during the Holocaust, on 24 June 1993. Schindler, along with Karl Plagg, Georg Ferdinand Duckwitz, Helmut Kleinick, and Hans Valls are among the few Nazi Party members to be given this award. Other awards include the German Order of Merit. Writer Herbert Steinhaus, 
who interviewed him in 1948, wrote that Schindler's exceptional deeds stemmed from just that elementary sense of decency and humanity that our sophisticated age seldom sincerely believes in. A repentant opportunist saw the light and rebelled against the sadism and vile criminality all around him. In a 1983 television documentary, Schindler was quoted as saying, I felt that the Jews were being destroyed. I had to help them, there was no choice. Chapter 2, Legacy Chapter 2 Section 1, Films and Book In 1951, Polik Pfefferberg approached director Fritz Lang and asked him to consider making a film about Schindler. Also on Pfefferberg's initiative, in 1964 Schindler received a $20,000 advance from MGM for a proposed film treatment titled To the Last Hour. Neither film was ever made, and Schindler quickly spent the money he received from MGM. He was also approached in the 1960s by MCA of Germany and Walt Disney Productions in Vienna, but again nothing came of these projects. In 1980, Australian author Thomas Keneally by chance visited Pfefferberg's luggage store in Beverly Hills while en route home from a film festival in Europe. Pfefferberg took the opportunity to tell Keneally the story of Oscar Schindler. He gave him copies of some materials he had on file, and Keneally soon decided to make a fictionalized treatment of the story. After extensive research and interviews with surviving Schindler Jidden, his 1982 historical novel Schindler's Ark was the result. The novel was adapted as the 1993 movie Schindler's List by Steven Spielberg. After acquiring the rights in 1983, Spielberg felt he was not ready emotionally or professionally to tackle the project, and he offered the rights to several other directors. After he read a script for the project prepared by Steven Zalian for Martin Scorsese, he decided to trade him Cape Fear for the opportunity to do the Schindler biography. In the film, the character of Itzhak Stern is a composite of Stern, Bankier, and Pemper. Liam Neeson was nominated for the Academy Award for Best Actor for his portrayal of Schindler in the film, which won seven Oscars, including Best Picture. Other film treatments include a 1983 British television documentary produced by John Blair for Thames Television, entitled Schindler, His Story as Told by the Actual People He Saved, and a 1998 A.E. biography special, Oscar Schindler, The Man Behind the List. Chapter 2 Section 2, Schindler's Case in 1997 a suitcase belonging to Schindler containing historic photographs and documents was discovered in the attic of the apartment of Ami and Heinrich Stair in Hildesheim. Schindler had stayed with the couple for a few days shortly before his death in 1974. Stair's son Chris took the suitcase to Stuttgart, where the documents were examined in detail in 1999 by Dr. Wolfgang Borgmann, science editor of the Stuttgarter Zeitung. Borgman wrote a series of seven articles, which appeared in the paper from 16 to the 26th of October 1999, and were eventually published in book form as Schindler's Koffer, Berichte aus dem Leben eines Lebensretters, eine Dokumentation der Stuttgarter Zeitung. The documents and suitcase were sent to the Holocaust Museum at Yod Vashem in Israel for safekeeping in December 1999. Chapter 2 Section 3 Copies of the List in early April 2009, a carbon copy of one version of the list was discovered at the State Library of New South Wales by workers combing through boxes of materials collected by author Thomas Keneally. The 13-page document, Yellow and Fragile, was filed among research notes and original newspaper clippings. The document was given to Keneally in 1980 by Pfefferberg when he was persuading him to write Schindler's story. This version of the list contains 801 names and is dated the 18th of April 1945. Pfefferberg is listed as worker number 173. Several authentic versions of the list exist because the names were retyped several times as conditions changed in the hectic days at the end of the war. One of four existing copies of the list was offered at a 10-day auction starting on the 19th of July 2013 on eBay at a reserve price of $3 million. It received no bids. Chapter 2 Section 4, Other Memorabilia In August, 2013, 
a one-page letter signed by Schindler on the 22nd of August 1944 sold in an online auction for $59,135. The letter noted Schindler's permission for a factory supervisor to move machinery to Czechoslovakia. The same unknown auction buyer had previously purchased 1943 construction documents for Schindler's Krakow factory for $63,426. Chapter 3, Sources Abramson, Alana. Schindler's List Receives Zero Bids on eBay. ABC News. Retrieved 30 July 2013. Belafonte, Genia. Schindler, The Real Story. The New York Times. Archived from the original on 10 June 2012. Retrieved 20 May 2010. Brazosquinia, Aldemar. Zablasi, Clodnii Fabriki. Gazata y Borzar. Krakow, Agora S.A. Archived from the original on 18 April 2010. Retrieved 28 June 2013. Crow, David M. Oscar Schindler, The Untold Account of His Life, Wartime Activities, and the true story behind the list. Cambridge, Massachusetts, Westview Press. ISBN 978-0-465-002535. Evans, Richard J. The Third Rye in Power. New York, Penguin. ISBN 978-0-14303798. Michael. The Search for Major Plague, The Nazi Who Saved Jews. Fordham, Fordham University Press. ISBN 0-8232-2446. Goodman, Walter. Oscar Schindler, The Man Behind the List. The New York Times. Archived from the original on 10 June 2012. Retrieved 20 May 2010. Keneally, Thomas. Searching for Schindler, a memoir. New York, Nan A. Talese. ISBN 978-0-385-52617-3. Kepler, Adam W. Schindler letter sells for nearly $60,000. The New York Times. Retrieved the 19th of August, 2013. Longerich, Peter. Holocaust, The Nazi Persecution and Murder of the Jews. Oxford, New York, Oxford University Press. ISBN 978-0-19280436-5. McBride, Joseph. Steven Spielberg, A Biography. Jackson, University Press of Mississippi. ISBN 978-160473-836-0. Roberts, Jack L. The Importance of Oscar Schindler. The Importance of Biography Series. San Diego, Lucent. ISBN 156,060794. Wazaplinski, Andrzej. Prosecution of Nazi Crimes in Poland in 1939-2004. First International Expert Meeting on War Crimes, Genocide, and Crimes Against Humanity. Lyon, France, International Criminal Police Organization, Interpol General Secretariat. Archived from the original on 3 March 2016. Retrieved 31 December 2014. Safia, Alexander Bodder. The tip-off from a Nazi that saved my grandparents. BBC News. Retrieved the 22nd of April 2019. Schindler, Emily, Rosenberg, Erica. Where Light and Shadow Meet. New York, London, Norton. ISBN 0393041239. Silver, Eric. The Book of the Just, The Silent Heroes Who Saved Jews from Hitler. New York, Grove Press. 
ISBN 978-0297-81245-6. Smith, Emily. Schindler's List will be publicly auctioned, one of only four existing copies in the world. New York Post. Retrieved 19 July 2013. Staff. Miatek Pemper. The Daily Telegraph. Retrieved 7 July 2013. Staff. Schindler's List found in Sydney. BBC Online. BBC News. Agents France Press. Retrieved 17 July 2013. Steinhaus, Herbert. The Real Oscar Schindler. Saturday Night. Andela Publishing. Retrieved 28 June 2013. Thompson, Bruce, ed. Oscar Schindler. People Who Made History. San Diego, Greenhaven Press. ISBN 0737089482.